can do is that. And what I can do is um, this. Hi, Gabe. You in, Gabe? Hey, Professor. Yes, I'm in. Okay, Gabe, I, I need to ask you a question. I'm fairly sure on the answer, but I, I just need to ask a question. Did we end, did we end uh, at equivalent weights on uh, Tuesday? Uh, I had to leave a little bit early. Ah, okay. For my math. No, no problem, Gabe. Uh, I'm just seeing the last note I have. Um, I think we stayed a little bit after anyway, Gabe. Yeah. Kevin, you out there? I am out there. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin, about the uh, uh, re-looking at your stuff, but uh, unfortunately, I just don't have the time. I understand. Uh, I'll, trust me. Okay, Kevin? That's all I can tell you right now. Okay? Yep, thank you. Uh, Kevin, do you remember where we ended? Do we end at uh, equivalent weights? Do we get through the entire slideshow or? I think. Uh, Jessica, do you uh, know? Oh, we did. And I know Jasmine also left a little bit early. I, I'm, oh, I'm not sure now. Okay, I'll, I'll just go over it real quick. Jasmina, Jessica, I believe I got through equivalent weights with you all on Tuesday. Is that true? We went all the way. I think we did all the assets and bases. Okay, let's let's let me pull up the slides and. And I was a little confused taking the gas law quiz last night. <laughs> I was like, I don't think we've learned this yet. Uh, yeah, you haven't. That was because <laughs> I'm, that was, I was supposed to be in the second day of the gas laws. Okay. Yeah. So what can I tell you? I may give you a second attempt at it. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Yeah. Fair enough, guys. I'm sorry, I, I, literally speaking, I thought that I would get to get through acid bases within half the period and be able to get through and do uh, uh, the, the gas loss a little bit. We did not do equivalent weights. We did all the way through titration, but I don't think we did equivalent weights. Is that good with everybody else? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me see. I need to, just need to find it. <laughs> okay. All right. Equivalent weights is a. It's kind of an easy. It's kind of an easy concept, but it's got just a little trick to your mind that you got to work around it. All right. And all an equivalent weight is, is that's the mass required to deliver one mole of something. Okay. In this case, when we're talking about acids and bases, we're talking about how much of the acid will deliver one mole of H3O plus. Does that make sense to you? Guys? Yeah. All right. If I have 36.5 grams of HCl. That's one mole of HCl, right? Right? Yeah. Hydrogen weighs one, chlorine weighs 35 and a half, 36 and a half grams. If I have 36 and a half grams of HCl, that will deliver one mole of H plus. 
Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so, and this somehow got away from me. Are you still seeing, are you seeing the screen? It says equivalent weights on it. Yeah. All right. Now, if I'm dealing with a different acid, Kevin, H2SO4, how many H pluses can H2SO4 deliver? If I have one mole of H2SO4, how many moles of H plus can that deliver? I'm not sure what the molar mass of H2SO4 Do is. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the formula. If I have one mole of H2SO4. Oh, oh, one mole. How many H's are there, Kevin? Oh, there's two moles. So if I, I have mean, two one, H's. If I have one mole of H2SO4, how many moles of H plus can that deliver? Two. Two. We're all seeing that? Okay. So if I want the weight that will deliver one mole of H plus, wouldn't I have to divide my molecular weight in half? Because I'd want a half a mole of H2SO4, so I can only deliver one mole of H plus. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So if the molecular weight of sulfuric acid is 98 grams per mole, and I only need half a mole to deliver one mole of H plus, then my equivalent weight, the weight that will deliver one mole of H plus is gonna be half my molecular weight, or 49. So my equivalent weight is going to be 49 for sulfuric acid. Is this making sense? Yeah. Jessica, I, I'm, I'm hearing Kevin. Kevin, it's great that you're giving me the yes, but I need Jessica, Jasmina, Ian, and who else is in here? Cassidy. I need, are you, Cassidy, you just joined us. I understand that. Ian, yeah. you're good with, we, are you good with this, Ian? Ian, are you not mic'd up? No, I am. My bad. Are you uh, understanding this concept? I missed Tuesday's video, so I'm kind of lost, if I'm being honest. Okay. I didn't hop in the Zoom, so I got to rewatch that, and then... Okay, well, just, that's, that's fine. This literally speaking, I've got five more slides to go in this, all right? Then we're going to hop into gas laws. Now, the concept is in, all right? An equivalent weight, by definition, is the weight that you need to deliver one mole of something, okay? So if I have, if I have 36.5 grams of HCl, that's the weight of one mole of HCl, and because there's only one H in HCl, that will only deliver one mole's worth. Okay. So the equivalent weight of HCl is going to be the molecular weight, which is 36.5. However, if I have H2SO4, how many H's will H2SO4 deliver for every one mole of H2SO4? How many H pluses are in H2SO4? Okay, I'm Ian, are you out there? Oh yeah, did not go through, I said two. Oh, I did not hear you. Okay, My so bad. there are two. So if 98 grams makes one mole of H2SO4 and that one mole of H2SO4 will deliver two moles of H plus, what is the weight of H2SO4 that will deliver one mole of H plus? it's gonna be half of the molecular weight, right? Right. So half of 98 is gonna be 49. The equivalent weight of sulfuric acid is going to be 49. Coincidentally, the, the molecular weight of phosphoric acid is also 98. Now, Cassidy, 
If I have one mole of H3PO4, how many moles of H plus does that deliver? Three. Three. So if I have 98 grams of H3PO4, that will deliver three moles worth of H plus, right? Yes. So to get one mole of H plus, I have to divide the 98 by three. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it, that's, that makes sense. The reason we go through this rigmarole is because when you are titrating an acid versus a base and you have, and you have an unknown acid, you don't know how many H pluses that acid will deliver. So all you can report out is its equivalent weight. For example, if I did, if I did uh, H3PO4, if I did H3PO4 versus sodium hydroxide, I would be able to titrate the H pluses versus the OHs in NaOH. And since I know it's NaOH, I know it delivers one mole of OH, okay? So the one mole of OH will neutralize one mole of H plus. Have I got you there, guys? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now, when I go from that, say I weighed out my acid and put that into, into my flask, titrated it with my NaOH. I know from the volume and molarity of my NaOH what the moles of OH are. I know from the fact that it's pink that the moles of OH equal moles of H+. The trouble is, it's an unknown acid. I don't know whether it's delivered, that acid has delivered one, two, or three H pluses. So when I go out, I have the weight and I have the moles of H plus. When I divide the weight by the moles of H plus, that gives me an equivalent weight. If I would do that for this example, my equivalent weight would be 32.66, seven going on forever. Professor, so that, yes. Sorry, uh, I'm pretty sure you mentioned this earlier, but how do you know how many moles you have again? How do you know uh, it's like three? How, I'm sorry, how many moles? Of oh, the oh, H3PO4. Okay, how many H's are there? Oh, there's three. So that means there's three moles for the whole thing? There's three, if I have one mole of H3PO4, that will deliver three moles of H+. plus. Okay, okay, that makes sense, thank you. All right, so. Getting back to my unknown situation, I know how many moles of H plus I have because I've done the titration. I weighed my sample out to begin it, to, at the beginning. So you know that if you divide grams by moles, you get the molecular weight. But I don't know whether my unknown delivers one, two, or three. So my equivalent weight could be 32.67, it could be 65.333, or it could be, uh, my molecular weight could be 32.67, my molecular weight could be 65.33, or it could be 98. That's because I don't know how many H's my acid will deliver. I'm going more into detail than I really want to, but are you kind of understanding what's going on? Give me feedback, guys. Does this yeah, make sense? I yeah, I understand it. Okay. When you don't know the formula, or if you don't have a balanced chemical equation, all you can answer when you do a titration is the equivalent weight, since you don't know how many H's that acid will deliver. Problem, this is the same problem we did basically in class, only we did it in reverse. Uh, you have 0.2144 grams of an acid dissolved in 50 milliliters of water. 
You don't need to know the molarity of that acid because you can figure out how many moles of the acid you have by dividing the 0.211 by the molecular weight or equivalent weight. All right, what happens is this was titrated with your NaOH, an amount of moles of milliliters and at a concentration. The question is, what is the equivalent weight? Since I don't know what the acid is, I have to report it out as an equivalent weight. And it becomes the same problem that we had before. All we do is multiply the volume change to liters by the molarity. This gives us the moles of NaOH, which equals the moles of H plus at neutrality. Then we have the weight and we have the moles of the acid. We divide the weight by the moles of the H plus. This gives us 64 grams per mole. But understand, this is the amount of the acid that will deliver one mole of H plus. If the acid will deliver two moles, then we have to double this weight for the molecular weight. If the acid has three H's, we would have to triple this. Am I still on solid ground, guys? Yes. I'm hearing crickets. All right. Last thing. Last thing I'm going to tell you is I'm going to reiterate. I believe, Cassidy, you brought this up the other day. Yeah, that was me. MAVA -A equals MBVB. Okay, this is a quick, quick way to do molarity or volume calculations. All right? If the coefficient, if the coefficient of the acid in the overall balanced chemical equation, if the coefficient of the acid equals the coefficient of the base, you can use this formula. If it doesn't, you can't use this. You have to go through the long way. All right? Basically, if I have a molarity of my acid and I have a volume of my acid, that's going to equal a moles of my acid, correct? Yeah. All right, thank you for the yeah. Now, at neutralization, by definition, the moles of the HCl are going to equal the moles of the NaOH. So I get the moles of my HCl by taking the molarity times the volume. That's going to equal the moles of my NaOH, which is the molarity of my NaOH, times the volume of my NaOH. Generally speaking, when you are doing a titration, you're given three of these numbers. You're being asked to identify the fourth. So generally speaking, like the, the uh, uh, equations we've been doing in lab, we know the concentration. In, in the first example, we knew the concentration of the, let's shake that off. If we know the concentration of the base and we know the milliliters of the base, and we know the volume of HCl we added. Well, we have the volume of the acid, we have the concentration of the base, and we have the volume of the base. We have three of the four things here. We can easily solve for the fourth. Again, the only way you can do this is if the coefficients match. In other words, if you have the same number of H's as you do OH's. Easy formula. And the nice thing about this, you don't have to convert. As long as the label of the volume is the same in both instances, you don't have to convert it. Because if I have milliliters over here, I'm going to multiply this by one liter over a thousand milliliters. I have to do the same thing over here. So the one over a thousand will cancel out. I could do ounces. I could do quarts. I could do gallons. As long as the label of my volume is the same on either side, I don't have to convert it. Okay, any questions? I think somebody dropped out. Ian, were you saying that you weren't here the last time? 
Yes. Somebody dropped out. I don't know who it was, and I don't know why. Okay, are we good with the asses and bases, guys? Yeah. Probably a little longer than I wanted to spend on that this morning, but okay, we're going to get into the gas laws. Now, now begins your journey into new, new material. Okay, some of this is going to be familiar, some will not. Believe me, pay attention to the, read between the lines here, guys, pay attention to the kinetic molecular theory. You will see it again. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So in gas offs, we're going to first dis discuss the properties of gases. We're going to go through the kinetic molecular theory. Then we're going to deal with the ideal gas laws. I do this a little bit backwards. Other people start from doing the individual gas laws. I like to start from the ideal gas law. After the ideal gas law, we're going to go through the individual for the individual gas laws, then the combined gas law, Dalton's law, partial pressures. Then we're going to deal with gas laws and stoichiometry. Woohoo! Now, if I have a gas, you have to understand that if I have one gas molecule in this room, the volume of that gas molecule is the entire volume of the room. You will never have a, a situation where you have a gas in a volume where you have all the gas on one side of the, of the volume and the rest a vacuum. A gas completely fills its container and it also will take the shape of that container. When you compare gases to solids and liquids, they have a very, very, very low density. You can compress gases. If you have a gas mixture, it will always be homogeneous. And gases are fluids. That means they will flow from one area into another. Four properties, or four, four things that determine gas properties are pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. Everything is related back to standard temperature and pressure. Understand this, guys. If you see a gas at standard temperature and pressure, you are already given two of the parameters, two of the properties for that gas. You've given that its temperature is at zero Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin. And you're also given, you know, this is the exact number. The exact number is 10 to the fifth Pascals or that converts to 0.986. In all reality, guys, that 0 0.014 doesn't matter a whole lot. So if you see standard temperature and pressure, if you want to be exact, exact, you would, you would type in 0.986 atmospheres. But you're safe by convention to put one atmosphere as the standard pressure. Are we it. supposed to be seeing a slide right now? Ah, damn it. Thank you. Yes, you were. Okay. This is the slide. Does anybody need me to repeat any slides? I'm hearing crickets, so I am going to go on. Again, standard temperature is definitely zero degrees or 273.15. Standard pressure, if you want to be exact, exact, use the 0.986 atmospheres or 10 to the fifth Pascals. By convention, one atmosphere is usually used. Now, units of pressure. And the only reason I'm really, guys, this is only dimensional analysis things here. And the only reason I included this in the slideshow was I wanted to give you an easy reference. 
if you think, oh, what's the convention? What is the conversion between tors and pascals? I gave you an easy place for you to find it. Generally speaking, you will see pressure given in any one of these, any one of these labels. PSI, if you've ever filled your tires and you've tried to find that little number on the tire somewhere, yes, we still use PSI in the United States. Uh, generally speaking, when we're talking in scientific terms, you either hear tor or atmosphere. By the way, tor is equal to millimeters of mercury. Inches of mercury, you're gonna hear that anytime you hear a weather report. That's the pressure they give when they give the weather report. And the last one down here is pascals or kilopascals. That is a, another scientific term that's used. There's the conversions. Uh, do, I, do I need guys to go into conversion calculations? Yes. Okay, I'll go through one or two of them. Pressure in a tire is measured to be 45 PSI. Represent this pressure in atmospheres, Tor and Pascal. Okay, Ian, if I, my pressure is 45 PSI, I want that to be in atmospheres. What number am I going to multiply my 45 PSI to get my atmospheres? 14.69. Am I going to multiply it by 14.69? Uh, divide it. Going to divide it because I want my atmosphere label to be on my top, my PSA on the bottom, so the PSI labels will drop. So that would be 45 divided by 14.69. you would have 3.06 atmospheres, okay? Now, if I want to get, I'm gonna go with Pascal's next. If I have 3.06, if I have 3.06, and I'm looking for a pen so I can write that down somewhere. I swear to God, I had 10 pens here. If I have 3.06 atmospheres, Cassidy, what am I going to do to get, we'll go with Tor next. Um, atmosphere, or I have 3.06 atmospheres. I just figured out that 45 PSI by using this conversion, I put one atmosphere over 14.69 and the number I came up with 3.06 atmospheres. How do I get Tor out of that? So then you would multiply it by 760 tor. Over one atmosphere, yep. which is, which would be, by the way, the zero is, it's an exact number. Uh, 760 is exact. I believe the 101, 325 is exact. So you do that out, you do your number out, and you get 2,330. Are we good with this, guys? All we're doing is dimensional analysis here. Yeah. Yep. Now, if we're dealing with units of volume, we can be talking liters, quarts, milliliters, centimeters cubed. You, I hope you all realize at this point that one milliliter is equal to a centimeter cubed. You can deal with gallons, cubic inches, meters cubed. Okay, you can deal with all those things. Conversions are here. Ian, are we good about conversions? Yes. We're just dealing with dimensional analysis problems. On the other hand, we're dealing with temperature, we're dealing with centigrade, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Quick review, you can convert Fahrenheit to centigrade by taking your Fahrenheit temperature, subtracting 32, and dividing it by 
Remember, remember here, when you're dealing with sig figs, the 1.8 and the 332 are both exact numbers. So however many sig figs your Fahrenheit would have, that's how many sig figs your centigrade would have. Generally speaking, most thermometers go out to the tenth of a degree, or they measure to the degree you estimate to the tenth of a degree. So when you're adding Kelvin, since this is to the tenth of a degree, when you report out your Kelvin, you can add the 273.15, or you might as well just add 273.2, because if this is in tenths, is out to the tenths, then your Kelvin has to be reported out to tenths. And this is the only hundredth thing here, so it's going to round up that anyway. Are we good, guys? Again, I just put those in there just so you would have a quick reference for some conversion factors. Now, what the kinetic molecular theory does is it tries to relate the microscopic properties of a gas, such as velocity and position, to the macroscopic properties, which are temperature, pressure, volume, and uh, number of molecules. So that's what we're trying to do. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to relate a physics problem to a chemistry problem. Because when we get this low, when we're dealing with the microscopic properties, we are dealing with physics problems. How many of you have had a physics class in your life? I, I need to know if this for my own reference. Anybody? I've never had one. No. I've never taken one. Nope. I've never taken one, no. Okay. So we're gonna go at this. We're gonna try and go at this fairly slow. Do you know the concept of vectors? Do you know what a vector is? No. Okay. Before, what? but that's about it. <laughs> What's that, Cassidy? I've heard that word before, but that's about it. Okay. Say I'm moving. You see where my arrow is at, guys? You see where my arrow? No, no. Yeah. See where my arrow's at. If my arrow goes from this point to that point, do I not have a change in the run of that particle? If I go from this point to this point, yes. do I not have a change in the x direction? Yeah. Okay. Do I not also, if I'm going from here to here, do I not also have a change in the y direction? Yeah. All right. Now, what the concept you have to understand is as it's going slantedly, and I don't even know if slantedly is a word, but as it's going slantedly, it's making a contribution in the x direction and it's making a contribution in the y direction. They are not as equal to the overall, overall uh, change. For example, if I have a velocity going in this direction, I have a change in velocity on the y direction. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah but it's not equal because this is a slanted line. If I take that slanted line and put it all the way down in the X axis, it's gonna be larger than where that slanted line is on the X axis. This is because not all of the velocity is being put forth 100% in the X direction. It's also contributing something to the Y direction. So when you are dealing with a vector, a vector gives part of the quality to the x direction, the y direction, and the third dimension, the z direction. Anybody confused about that concept? All right. 
Kevin, did you have something to say? Um, no, I think I'll understand it when it's put into a formula better. The Z okay. direction I don't get, but that's fine. The assumptions we're making with the, with the kinetic molecular theory, the size of the particle is very, very small. The average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. In other words, the higher you, higher you heat something, the faster it moves. The particles don't exert any force on each other. They're in constant motion. And if you have a collision, it's elastic. You don't lose any kinetic energy to the friction of the actual collision. First one, it's fairly, fairly apropos because we're looking at a gas particle, which is a, either a carbon dioxide molecule or a hydrogen molecule, or even something like as small as nitrous oxide. They are very, very small in proportion to the entire volume of what we're talking about. Average kinetic energy, it makes sense that the more you heat something up, the faster it's going to go. They don't exert any force on each other. Mm. If you get one particle close to another particle, yeah, they do exert some part, some uh, force on one another. But in the larger picture, it's not significant compared to the forces that they're acting upon each other, upon themselves. Particles are in constant motion, except at absolute zero. And that last one also is kind of an iffy one. When two things bang into each other, they don't bang off with equal and opposite force. What happens is you lose something in the collision. All right, some physics equations. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. By definition, acceleration is the velocity divided by time. The change in velocity divided by the change in time. Therefore, if I substitute the acceleration for, if I accelerate the, the acceleration into this equation, I get that the force is equal to the mass of the particle times the change in velocity over the change in time. Now, if I want to figure out the change in velocity and I have a particle of gas, that particle of gas is going to move into a straight line. We're just talking. We are just talking the x-axis. If I have a particle of a gas that is moving along a straight line, its velocity in the direction of x, it hits the side and it bounces back. To get back to the same point, I have the velocity going in the positive direction minus the velocity going in the negative direction. So the change in velocity is going to be equal to 2v in the x direction. Guys, jump at me if you don't understand something. Are we good there? Everything I've talked about so far, is it making sense? Yeah. Yeah. So far. All right. So if I substitute my change in velocity, remember I just said it was equal to 2v in the x direction. If I substitute that into this equation, I get that my force is equal to 2mv divided by my change in time. Now, if I use the entire length of my volume, okay, and I want I to determine the time it takes for me to go from one side of the, of the volume to the other. 
Well, that's two lengths, isn't it? If I'm doing a pull, and I, I'm not going to just stay at the other end of the pull, I'm going to go to the end of the pull and come back to have a whole lap, correct? So the distance for a whole lap, if my pull is 25 meters, then the distance for the whole lap is going to be 50 meters. So my distance, my velocity is distance divided by time. So it's going to take me, my distance is two L's. So my change in time is equal to 2L over V. Again, I'm going to substitute this 2L over V into this equation. And I'm going to get this equation. Okay. Now you have to understand that this is 2L divided by X. So the two cancels and I'm dividing this into this, this makes my VX squared. So I have now, I've now derived by putting that 2L over VX into this equation, I've now derived an equation. The force is equal to MV squared over L. Again, do I have you guys? Where's the X come in where it's I'm just two M V X? Ian, for right yes. now, for right now, I'm being I'm trying to be very simplistic. I'm talking about the motion along one axis. And I just chose the X as opposed to the Y or Z. Oh, okay. All right. Now comes in. Now comes in the vector thing, okay? I've been talking about going in one direction, but I could be going this way, in which case, if I go straight up, my velocity in the X direction is zero. If I go straight out, if I go straight out, the velocity in the X direction is going to be zero again. If I do it on a slant, a portion of this velocity is going to be going in the X direction. If I go this way, a portion of the velocity is going to be going in the X direction. That's what vectors are. So, if I want the average X contribution to the velocity, that's going to be equal to all the velocities times the contribution of each one, each one divided by a number. So, so my V X direction average, my V squared X direction average is going to be equal to all of my velocities in the X direction squared divided by the number. That's all I'm doing here is making an average. Do I still have you guys? I'm hearing crickets. We're still talking about the velocity along the X direction. If I have a whole bunch of them and I want to get the average velocity because I'm not going to just take into account the ones that are going in the X direction. I want the velocity of the, the average velocity of all of them so I can make a determination. And all I need to do to get the average velocity is add up all the Vs and divide it by the number of particles I have. All I'm doing is getting an average. So if I take this, if I substitute in here my V average N, into this, I divide both sides by N. Hold on one second. The neighbor's cat likes to go on the roof next door. 
and the dogs can see it. I hope that'll quiet things. So if I substitute this equation in here, what I would get is v squared average times n is equal to uh, is equal to vx squared. So I take vx average times n, plug it in there, and then that solves for my force divided by number of particles is equal to m vx average squared divided by l. Are we good, guys? What is M in the equation? Mass. Mass, volume, it's L. No, but mass, velocity. Oh, velocity. Mass, velocity, length, L is the length of the, of the path, F is the force, N is the number of particles. I know this is a whole bunch, guys. In order for you to understand this, I, my suggestion would be, once you get done with this today, I would go in and view the, uh, the, view the presentation, I believe it's from Khan Academy, that I have in the online outline. That will give you a different perspective on it and might give you a little more insight into this. Okay, do we have an understanding how we went from this equation down to this one? Why at the end of the equation is the average squared? Because this is squared. Okay. okay. Kevin, I've got my relationship. All this is my average is equal to all of the velocities divided by the number of particles I have, right? That's how you get an average, right, Kevin? Yeah. So in this case, what I did was I multiplied both sides by n. I got v squared x average times n is equal to vx squared. So I substituted v squared x average times n for vx squared. OK? OK. Then what I did was I divided both sides, both sides by n. I ended up with this equation. My force divided by my number of particles is equal to my mass times my velocity in the x direction squared divided by the length of my, the length of my volume, the length of the path. OK, so I have that number up there which is equal to, I don't know why I did that, but which is equal to this. Force is equal to number of particles times mv x average squared divided by L. Now, if I divide both sides by the area, by the area of one of the sides that's being hit, F divided by A is equal to NMV, VX average squared divided by LA. Length times area is the volume, is it not, guys? Give me that one at least. Yes. Okay, so length times my area is my volume. F Force divided by area is the definition of pressure. So right now, I've got PV is equal to NMV x average squared. I've got two of my unknowns in the ideal gas law solved for. I've only got to get the other two going, OK? Are we good so far on this, guys? Yes. All right. Now, I have to realize I've been talking X. I've been talking X direction this whole time. I need to discuss all three directions and not just X. So if I want the velocity 
of all three directions, I'm going to get the velocity total is going to be equal to the velocity in the x direction plus the velocity in the y direction plus the velocity in the z direction. So my total volume, since they're all equal to one another, and they're all equal to one another because there's no, nothing that says going in the x direction is any different from the y or the z. So that's the reason they're all equal to one another. Since they're all equal to one another, my total velocity squared is going to be equal to three times my velocity in the x direction squared. So I substitute that in my equation and I get this is the equation. All I'm doing is substituting in for Vx average squared, I'm substituting in 3, three of V squared. So if I have this number, in order to substitute in for Vx squared, I have to divide V total squared by 3 which gives me this solution so far. I got PV is equal to NMV total squared divided by three. Now here's the trust me thing. The trust me thing is when I get to this point, what happens is I can see where I need to go, but I can't explain why I multiply both sides by three halves. Okay, what I'm seeing, what I can tell you, do you see this is mv squared over three? Do you see that? Do you see that? If I eliminate the n from this, I get mv squared divided by three, correct? Yeah. All right, if I multiply mv squared divided by three, if I multiply that by three halves, I get one half mv squared. That is the kinetic energy, which we're going to use to relate to temperature. That's why we're multiplying by, both, by three halves. If you don't understand that, then just trust me. If I do multiply both sides by three halves, I get three PV divided by two is equal to N times one half MV squared. Then from the Boltzmann distribution, it's a, it is a term which relates velocities to temperature. By the Boltzmann distribution, I get three halves a constant times the temperature is equal to one half mv squared. So if I substitute three halves 2kt into one half mv squared, the three halves on this side cancels with the three halves on this side, and I end up with pv is equal to n number of particles times a constant times my temperature. We're pretty good, close, guys. We have the PV and the T, and we have number of molecules and a constant. By conversion, we, if we know the number of molecules, can't we convert that into number of moles? Yes. Yes. So okay. we change the molecules to moles by multiplying it by Avogadro's number. And we change that, that, the number that comes up, we also incorporate into that K constant. And we have now derived the ideal gas law. I understand, guys. This is kind of an out there thing. Do we have a sense of what is going on here? 
Yes. I mean, I'm not asking for you to be able to derive the equation right now. This is going to take a little bit of work on your parts. I would definitely view the other video. I would, if necessary, review what I've been talking about here. But it's going to take one or two times for this stuff to, to wrap yourself, wrap your head around and be able to explain it. And guys, I just spent a half an hour of our precious class time on it. What are the chances you're going to see this again? Really high. I would say there are, I would say that this is going to be about 10% of your next test. So be able to be able to describe how the ideal gas law was derived. All right. Now, we have the ideal gas law out here. PV equals NRT. Everybody has seen this before, right? Yeah. By the way, guys, I've now given you another tool for stoichiometry and is moles. There is now another way for you to get moles. You have four ways now. Grams divided by molecular weight. Volume of the gas at STP. Molarity and volume. And the ideal gas law. Now, this is crucial. I'm, I'm taking this part out because I've seen this mistake made too many times. If I give you a problem and I give you the volume of a liquid with its molarity, would you put the volume in an ideal gas law and try and solve the problem that way? No. For one thing, you're not dealing with the gas. For another thing, you're dealing with a volume that is with a molarity. So in that, if that's the case, just because I give you a volume does not mean you have to use the ideal gas law. Just keep that in mind. All right. We have a gas in the ideal gas law. We have a pressure for that gas, we have a volume, we have a number of moles, and we have a temperature. If I divide, if I divide my PV by RT, I'm sorry, PV by NT, do I not get PV over NT is equal to R? Yes. All right. If I change all four conditions, if I change all four conditions, then I have PV, P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to R. And also the new conditions, P2 over V2 divided by NT2 over T2 is equal to R. Both conditions are equal to each other. So P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to P2, V2 over N2, T2. Remember this. If you remember this one, you don't ever have to memorize the other gas laws. Jasmina. Yes. If I tell you in this equation, that N1 is equal to N2. What can you do with the number of moles in this equation? N1 is equal to N2. They're the same, Jasmina. They're the same on both sides of the equal sign. What can you do with them? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean. Like okay. what the answer is. All right. Let's get out of here and let me rewrite this. Okay. 
if n1 is equal to n2, then isn't p1 v1 divided by n1 t1 equal to p2 v2 divided by n1 t2? Is that not true, so Jasmine? Like, it is. So, so you can cancel them out. I can cancel them out. Okay? So if N is constant, if the number of my moles does not change from the left side to the right side, I can eliminate it in the equation. If I eliminate it in the equation, I get P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. I've just derived the combined gas law. I don't have to memorize it. All I have to do for all the gas laws I'm gonna mention from now on is all I have to do is look at the problem. I have to look at the problem. I have to decide what's changing, what's staying the same. If it's changing, I leave it in there. If it's staying the same, if it's being constant, I eliminate it from the equation. After all the eliminations, I just plug in the values. So when we're doing gas law problems, I'm gonna state this now because it seems an appropriate moment. When, write this down. When you are looking at a gas law problems, if conditions do not change. Use the ideal gas law. If conditions are changing, you figure out what is being, what is, uh, being changed and what is staying constant. You look at the overall equation that I've given you. You eliminate what's staying constant and you just leave what's remaining that will be the equation you use. Just plug in the numbers because that's really all gas law problems are, are plugging the numbers into the formula you're given. Does that seem to make sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just went through all that. All right. I gave you a perfect example. In Boyle's law, Moles and temperature are constant. <clears throat> if moles and temperature change, Boyle's law can't work. It says that moles and temperature are constant. So, literally speaking, I got N1 T1 is equal to N2 T2. Eliminate it. Eliminate the N1 T1. Uh, T1. Eliminate the Ns and the Ts. And I'm left with P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Again, is this making sense to you? Yeah. Okay. We'll probably get through Avogadro's law today. Probably. And then we have the rest of the gas laws on Tuesday. And I sent an announcement in an email. The test has been rescheduled from next Tuesday to next Thursday. And I will give you another attempt on today's quiz. All right. If we're dealing with pressure, okay, looking at pressure, by the way, this is still dealing with the kinetic molecular theory. So this is kind of things you just have to, these are things that make sense, but they're the scientific reason why they make sense. Gas molecules in constant motion, what they do is they bang against the sides of, the, of whatever container they're in. When they bang on those sides, the sum of those collisions is called the pressure. We've already said pressure is equal to force divided by area. And keep in mind that the surface area is related to the entire volume of the container. 
So if I have the force of one molecule, force is equal to mass times acceleration, and I have X molecules, then the total force is going to be the number of hits times the mass times the acceleration. Temperature is a measure of that acceleration. So since pressure is equal to force divided by area and force is equal to NMA, then I can substitute the NMA in for force and I get P is equal to NMA divided by A. So I have, this is basically, I'm trying to take the kinetic molecular theory and bring it down into terms that you can basically understand and explain. That's what I'm doing here. Pressure is equal to, is directly equal to the number of particles times the mass, right? Isn't it N and M? Isn't that M and N and M? My pressure is directly related to the number of particles and the mass. Think moles. Pressure is directly related to moles. Pressure is directly related to acceleration. Remember, we said temperature is also directly related to acceleration. So pressure, as the acceleration goes up, pressure goes up. It's directly related. It's directly related to the it's directly related to the number of particles times the mass or the moles of the particle. As the moles go up, pressure goes up. And the last relationship, it's indirectly related to the surface area. So as pressure goes up, I'm excuse me, as, acceler as the area goes up, am I not dividing by a bigger number? As my area increases, am I not dividing by a bigger number? Yes. So as my, I'm dividing by a bigger number, this means, is my pressure going up or down? It's going down. So as area goes up, or in other words, as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. They are indirectly related. Is this making sense, guys? Yeah. So there are three ways to increase the force. If you increase the temperature, the molecules move faster, force goes up. If force goes up, pressure goes up. If you decrease the area, if you decrease the area, the space between the walls is less. So you get more hits. If you get more hits, then the force goes up. So decreasing the volume, you get more hits, pressure goes up. If you increase the molecules, again, you get more hits on the surface. If you get more hits on the surface, you are increasing the force and increasing the pressure. So, we're going to get into the laws. First, Avogadro's law. The volume of a gas and the moles of that gas are directly proportional. They're equal to a constant if the pressure and temperature are constant. In other words, the more gas, the bigger the volume. Conversely, the less gas, the smaller the gas the smaller the volume. Think of it. Think of blowing up a balloon. As you are blowing up that balloon, are you not increasing the volume of the balloon? Yeah, yeah. So 
And as you loosen, as you take it out of your mouth and loosen it up, you take less air out, the volume goes back down again, right? Yeah. Don't yawn when you say yep, Kevin. Okay. Now, why does the volume stop? You're blowing up a balloon. Why does it stop? What makes the volume of the balloon be so much after you've blown it in? You stop adding more molecules. But more importantly? The pressure. Pressure inside equals the pressure outside. So the pressure inside and outside are constant. Okay? I haven't. When I'm blowing up that balloon, is the temperature changing? Am yeah. I going, am I going from going outside, going into a sauna and blowing up that balloon? No. So the temperature is constant. So I've got pressure constant, temperature constant. The only thing that changed the volume is the fact that I put more air into it. So it's directly proportional to the number of gas molecules in the volume. All right. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And basically, it makes sense. If you have one particle hitting the outside of the vessel with one unit of force, if you put two in there, you've got twice the force. Remember, pressure is force per area. So if I get the volume and divide it by the number of moles, that is going to be equal to a constant if I have constant pressure and temperature. If I change the one parameter, it's going to affect the other, but it's still going to equal that constant. So Avogadro's law, V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. You're at sea level and room temperature. If you do that, a balloon can be inflated to a maximum volume of 3.35 liters. You have blown 2.83 liters of air into the balloon and achieved 2.76 liters. How much more air do you need to push into the balloon before it bursts? Now, first of all, identify what is constant. The temperature and the pressure. Temperature and pressure are constant. So I can eliminate those from my P1, V1 over N1, T1 equal P2, V2 over N2, T2. So I can eliminate temperature and pressure from that. I have Avogadro's law. Okay? Now, how are we going to relate it? Anybody you have a suggestion? Solve for N2. Okay. I, I have a relationship. I have a relationship between moles and liters, but I don't know the moles that are associated with this. So I can solve for my second, my second, uh, second number of moles. I have 2.76 liters divided by 2.83 moles. That's equal to 3.35 liters over number I don't know. I solve for that, I get 3.43 moles. So that's the maximum capacity that my balloon can hold. If I go a little bit more than that, I will burst the balloon. So is that the answer to my final question? No. Why not, Kevin? You'd have to subtract 
the original molds because you want to know how much left you need. Okay. The question asks, how much more air do I have to push in the balloon? If I'm asking more air, that means that I already know I have that many moles in the balloon itself. So I take the 3.44, subtract out the 2.83. That gives me the more moles I need to push into the balloon. I have a question. Yeah, Kevin. So you do 2.7 divided by 2.83 and then just multiply the 3.35 over? No. What you do is you have to cross this, Kevin. You have to take the 2.76 liters times N is equal to 3.35 liters times 2.83 moles. Okay, okay. Then you take the 3.35 times the 2.83 Divide that by 2.76. That will give you what your end value is. Does the answer, does the 3.44 make sense? Yeah. Because your volume increased, you expect your moles to increase too. And 3.43 is bigger than 2.83. If in this instance, we would have gotten a number such as uh, 2.23. You know you did something wrong. The biggest problem you have in gas law problems is keeping the same parameters with the same, the same conditions together. That's the, that's the biggest problem I have found in gas law problems. Okay, we're going to start up with a couple more problems in Avogadro's Law on Tuesday. And we will get through all the gas laws by the end of Tuesday. Test will be on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Any questions about what we've done so far? Guys? No. This, the first time I had this presented to me, it blew my mind. Yeah, I, have, I just need to practice it, I think. I have the advantage over you because I've been teaching it for eight years. And I've had, I've had how many lectures of this before? Plus, I had to study it again myself. When I created this PowerPoint, I had to study the con video that's, that I'm presenting to you as well on the online outline. I had to study that to figure out what was going on again. So I can understand that this is not easy, but it's something you have to get down. Okay, have a good weekend. <laughs> you want to get out. Bye, Kevin. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I just need to practice. Any questions by anybody else? The quiz on... Today? No. I, I did today's at like 4 o'clock in the morning because I fell asleep early. Um, no, quiz nine. What was quiz nine on? Because uh, I, I missed that one. It, it was hard solution, easy gas laws. Yes, it was hard. It was hard, uh, hard acid base solution questions. Okay. Hard, was hard that acid. from the video Tuesday? Or would that yes. have been Thursday's video? Okay. That would have been... Okay, quiz nine, I'm sorry, I'm sitting here. This is Tuesday the 29th. Quiz nine would have been hard questions on solution and acid base, easy questions on gases. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Jasmina. I'm doing good. I just need to go through it as well. Does it seem to make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're doing, you're doing fine, Jasmine. You have a good weekend too. You're doing fine. All right. Take care. Take care.